So, hey, Delek Budala, professor, associate professor at ITB Bandung in the Department of Planning. It's really great. I'm really appreciative that you're chatting with us today about housing policy in Indonesia and land use regulation there. It's good to see you. We haven't seen each other. Did you, you were at UCLA for a conference a couple of years ago? Yeah, you're right. That was um, the last time we saw each other, right? Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so I guess uh, the first, I mean, I would, I would love for you to give us, for the students, just like a perspective, kind of a big picture perspective on housing policy in Indonesia and kind of access to housing and kind of whatever you think would be important to know about this topic. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Pavlo, for these uh, chats and conversation. And uh, housing is uh, being and always be an important uh, policy in Indonesia uh, with regards to uh, our development. And housing, uh, there has been uh, so many, let's say, uh, project-based uh, programs in the past years. Mm -hmm. But uh, fundamentally, uh, the housing policy system in Indonesia, I think it's quite uh, stable, stable in a way that uh, and normally the government, especially the central government, uh, effectively play more on the regulatory sides of the housing provision, at least uh, since the uh, investment booms in the late 80s or 90s. Effectively, government uh, mostly act more on the regulatory sides mm. of the uh, efforts while the housing provisions uh, mostly relies on the private sectors and, and, and the self-help housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the mom at the moment, we have uh, on figures uh, a kind of uh, big housing backlogs, although I didn't remember the figures, but at the micro level, uh, the government uh, things that we have a backlog and quite huge. But if you if we go into a micro data at the region or city level, it's more on the uh, accessibility to certain uh, levels of communities. And, and uh, so that make things more complicated. So this the distribution mm -hmm. is the issue. Yeah, when you, sorry, when you say uh, project-based, could you just describe, this is like the Rusunami type directly supported public housing? Mm -hmm. Could you what describe I mean by, that a little bit? What I mean by the project based, uh, actually the government uh, has never had a very uh, long term or comprehensive perspective or policy with regards to uh, housing provisions. And uh, let's say that the grand design and even the institutional structures in terms of financing or the development, uh, the, the developers, I mean, the, the, the government supported developers. Mm -hmm. In the past, in the, during the 70s until 80s, we have a quite, we had quite strong uh, state-owned companies called Perumnas or National Housing Developers. But now it's, it's, it's very small one. And, mm. and, and that clearly uh, the government has no uh, clear or set strategies to deal with mm. uh, housing in terms of uh, for the long terms. Although in the past years, the financing is getting, uh, becoming an issues and uh, the government trying to relocate some uh, public funding schemes or reorganizing the structures like the pension fund, but it's mm -hmm. still, uh, we didn't have such a strong institution uh, in terms mm -hmm. of housing provisions and, and more relies on the pro project based, meaning uh, it's more uh, reactive or politically reactive or maybe investment uh, oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, and it's it tends to be fragmented or smaller scales. Uh, 
Right. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, we call it bedah rumah or uh, the refurbication of the houses or mm -hmm. re re renovation, housing renovation, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, rusunawa or flat uh, subsidized flat, right. and then subsidized uh, mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, or for example, uh, relocation for the post uh, disaster areas. Mm -hmm. uh, while the bigger projects are still in the conception, like uh, in the National Development Planning Agency, they have, well, they, they thought of uh, that the government also might think of uh, making a larger, large scale projects. But still, uh, the, the government doesn't have a strong arm or mm. let's say the business arm to really uh, implement it. And mm. in many cases, the bigger project is has been uh, initiated by the big private developers. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that's quite, uh, I think that it's, it's quite uh, unique in your mission. Uh, I don't know how, how many similarities with some other countries, but we had some strong uh, state-owned companies in oil or in infrastructure like toll roads, we had quite strong one. But in terms of uh, land property development, we, did, we didn't have such big uh, state-owned companies. Mm -hmm. And even uh, in Indonesia, is uh, it tends to be that uh, the most, uh, let's say the, the richest companies or businessmen is actually uh, land developers or housing developers or estate developers. So it's, mm. it's private, private one. And, and, mm -hmm. and that, that's one of the big issues here that made the government difficult to plan or manage a larger scale project or even programs or long-term programs. I guess. Right. Interesting. So then the, the, the topic of this week is land use regulation. Um, and so I guess I'll turn it over to Nolan to start asking you questions about how uh, planning and land use regulations work in Indonesia. Yeah, real quick, I wanted to ask, you mentioned self-help housing and how that plays an outsized role in Indonesia housing policy. Could you just define that and sort of explain where that fits into housing in Indonesia? Yeah. Uh... Well, uh, actually, uh, one of the, uh, let's say, uh, famous programs since the 70s is uh, KIP, Kampung Improvement Programs or Settlement Improvement Programs. Uh, and that was quite uh, hallmarks in the 70s uh, to be considered as a good practice from Indonesia and in many ways exported uh, throughout the third world countries in the past decades. And, uh, but uh, until now, uh, I think th this, this is still like uh, fragmented programs or mostly initiated uh, from below. And, and, and there has been no uh, clear uh, grand design to really uh, empower uh, the community to uh, build their own houses because uh, it's more like uh, the government uh, focus on the distribution of like subsidies or uh, building uh, small uh, pathways or, or, or access to their houses uh, and, and now in many ways, uh, again, it, it's, it's more like uh, project oriented, but there is a chance uh, there has been uh, some practices since the uh, village laws. So, so in, in the past two decades, we have, uh, we are moving towards a decentralized system. And the last one was the uh, strengthening of the, village community 
and now with that new law, the government give directly the money to the village. And in, in many areas, they use this to uh, improve the houses and access to houses. And that's considered to be more uh, role on the communities. Uh, so is the money going directly to the village? So the, the, the local people uh, has more priority to be engaged in, in the implementation, even some of them are becoming the workers. Uh, but again, when talking about the projects uh, initiated from the central governments, and it's more like down from above and it's less consideration about uh, the role of the communities or even uh, the needs analysis, uh, meanings uh, whether the project is really at the needs of the local people. Uh, but there are some, some uh, good practices initiated by the local governments uh, or mayors, but it, it's more like uh, cases rather than uh, right. overall situation in Indonesia. Strategy. <laughs> Yeah. What on the on the topic? So, like the kampung are is the term that refers to kind of a village area, sort of in a city. Is that correct? Or what? What is a kampung? Yeah, this is interesting because uh, maybe in the global or Western literature, when you talk about kampung, it's more like it seems to be uh, denotes the irregular urban settlements. Mm -hmm. But in Indonesian context, uh, even in the culturally or socially, we are not really clear in defining uh, the city or the country. So when we talk about mm -hmm. Kampung, it's more uh, irregular or let's say uh, informally planned settlements. It can be mm -hmm. in the cities or in the rural setting, actually. I see. But maybe in terms of policy, uh, it tends to be like the issues or irregularity is happening more in the cities mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, the conceptual uh, understanding, at, at least at the global literature, it's more like bias toward the cities. Right. But so from people our only see it, it's, it's just irregular settlement. I mean, it's right. just, People only see it as a problem when it's in an urban area, right? In yeah. a rural okay. setting, it's it's just normal. But and so I mean, I, I really love Indonesian urbanization. I mean, there's so many aspects of like the informal neighborhoods that I think are really great in terms of walkability and street life and kind of I don't know interactions between people. Um, so I, I we're gonna do some kind of Google street views to look around Indonesian neighborhoods and see kind of what are the, the positive aspects of this style of urbanization. What do you have any sense of like in a city, like in a medium sized city in Indonesia, what, what share more or less of the housing was built through some kind of incremental or informal process versus like a developer built process? The, sorry, uh, you are asking about uh, representative cases or? Or just like what percent of housing more or less was built through informal process or like self-built process versus like developer built process? Yeah. In Bandung, for example, or Jakarta. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see uh, the last uh, figures uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the trends or the the general uh, situation is that uh, the older part of the cities are uh, let's say the, the old city center it tends to be uh, developed formally mm -hmm. by the government I think during let's say during sixties uh, or before. Mm -hmm. depending on, on the uh, history of the city or the, the age of the city. Mm -hmm. And then the, the expansion part 
uh, of the city. It's it's more like um, axis. For example, if you're looking at uh, Bandung, the expansion uh, towards let's say the south is more like uh, irregular settlements, but toward the north. It's more like middle class uh, planned houses. Mm -hmm. So it's more like a mixed mixture, the situation in different axes. Right. They have different uh, history or even values. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, as the city expands uh, in the surrounding suburbs, and then it's all occupied and there after that is next to the city is a new kind of new towns like in bandung we have some new towns in in the west and in the east and it's large scale and it's uh, privately planned but around it is also irregular uh kampung i don't know the percentage but uh that's fine ha uh, like like half or 20 a quarter three quarters well, actually, maybe relatively, uh, we have more uh, unplanned or, 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 or mm -hmm. at least uh, at the area scale planned. Yeah. Even the, some middle houses, actually, it's basically uh, in many ways, it's self help or the people right. by themselves uh, hire the contractor <laughs> to build. Yeah, no, that's, so that that's very. And, and that's make uh, things difficult also to for you to define uh, yep. to define that is plan or unplanned because right. it's kind of a trend that some developer they just uh, develop the land into basic uh, infrastructure uh -huh. and let and let the uh, residents to build by themselves for the right. houses. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's common in Latin America too, where you have a lot of neighborhoods where. You know, somebody owns a bunch of land, they just chop it up into parcels and sell it to people. And then yeah. maybe middle class families are like hiring contractors and architects to build the housing. Rather exactly. Than... But even even for some middle classes or or even some higher classes, uh, they uh, some of them prefer to build by themselves mm -hmm. and only relies on the basic infrastructure from the developers. Mm -hmm. And it's considered also to be cheaper overall in Indonesian context mm. to build by yourself, uh, mm. maybe considering all the costs that mm -hmm. you have to pay. Mm -hmm. And more customized. Yeah. Maybe that, that's, I don't know, it, it's also related to uh, consumption uh, level in Indonesia. In, in, in some figures, we are rather cons consumptive society so preference are very important of course <laughs> building houses <laughs> customization artisanal yeah well something that comes up in your work a lot is two factors the first is that there's been pretty rapid urban expansion in indonesia and the country has also undergone significant policy changes um, I'm interested from a land use perspective, how has land use planning changed and what implications has that had for housing policy as so many Indonesian cities have expanded? Yeah, uh, actually what might be a complex uh, situation is when we relate houses with uh, land policy and planning policy and that makes uh, maybe Indonesian case quite complex. First, uh, we have this uh, land policy regulation and special planning regulations. And before the current presidents, it's 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 from different compartment or different ministries. They uh, they they are not very much communicating with each other. And the land uh, now it's becoming one ministry, but in terms of uh, policy cultures, it's still divided in, in many respects, uh, but it's a good start at least. So in terms of housing, uh, or sorry, land, land administration policy, 
it, it's uh, it's quite old one. It dates back into the 60s when the beginning of the Suharto president, uh, sorry, during Sukarno president. And it was more uh, socialistic in nature and it's still being uh, uh, held by the governments, the basic agrarian laws. So we still use agrarian law where Indonesia is now urbanizing countries more than 50 percent ours, but we still name it uh, basic agrarian laws uh, where socialistic nature on the land is uh, norms in that uh, basic regulation and it's never changed almost half of centuries but uh, through decades the government uh, makes some operational regulations uh, in terms of government regulations or presidential regulation as an implementing uh, regulation to the law and it's tend to be inconsistent it meanings uh, the socialistic character in the basic law it actually uh, interpreted very uh, varying in, in the implementing regulation and more uh, market oriented regulation are built up uh, and, 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 and it's uh, it's been on the different periods, uh, but now actually in the past decade, maybe the government trying to bring back some government power into the land policy. For example, uh, through the law on eminent domain, for example, because in the 80s, 90s, uh, virtually the government seems to have no power to acquire the land. It's, it's really market system that's working. Uh, the implementing regulation is very much market system. But uh, with the situation after the crisis and then the global crisis, we are have uh, infrastructure backlog and then the government make this eminent domain policy and have the special special power to acquire uh, land for public purposes. Uh, although now, in 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 many cases, it's more for the large scale development <laughs> infrastructure, but also uh, any kind of uh, uh, like toll road. Uh, so it's still some uh, market oriented respect are there, and this this the special. Uh, planning uh, it's more at the political power i guess uh, it's more like following the trends uh, in many ways it's more uh, dynamic but uh, some market oriented uh, system are uh, placed like uh, in the past decades we also adopt zoning type of regulation to 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 make clear all the parcels uh, to, to provide some certainty for the investors through zoning uh, regulations and uh, so so it's more like uh, market endorsement uh, elements in the special planning uh, but but yeah the implementation is uh, much more the issue, especially uh, in the special planning, because uh, in many ways, it's more like the justification for the development that are taking place driven by the market. That is what's mm -hmm. happening in many cities. So it's more like the formalization of the trends, or mm -hmm. at least the planners, are caught in the situation that with the strong pressures from the market they, they, they just have limited spa space to really direct the development mm. in the special plan policy i have a follow-up question about implementation but maybe nolan do you want to well i i think we probably have a similar question here where the 
This is a really interesting theme that comes up in your work and some of Pablo's work is this tension between the plans that are on the books or maybe even the specific land use regulations that are on the books and then how those are enforced in practice. Pablo's done some work on this, but you've talked a lot about how decentralization over the last 30 years has shaped land use planning. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that and how it's shaped housing policy. Yeah. Uh, since the decentralization, uh, almost many uh, public affairs are uh, given to the local governments. Uh, in the beginning, it was uh, cities, municipalities, and regencies, including uh, housing provision. And the government are only has the power to uh, build the, the national system, uh, meaning we are still a unit, unitary state. So the local and regional government are not allowed to make their own system. We are one system. Uh, but the government is more like the national regulatory uh, frameworks. And in practice, uh, the housing provision is uh, the, the local government's uh, affairs, but the central governments still have some, this is what I call project-based. So, so it's more like incentive. The government has some, retained some programs or projects and given to the local government who can meet some criteria like co-funding or the, the readiness of the local governments or some actors, uh, facilitators, and then the government can support with uh, top-down projects, something like that. And in terms of uh, the situation after this decentralization, uh, I didn't see uh, any good practices that the or or maybe limited practices where the local governments has a good grand design on housing provision. So in many cases, it's not just in housing that uh, the local governments, although they retain some powers they just follow uh, what the standard that are made by the, the central government. So, 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 that's, uh, so that's the situation. I mean, the, the, there has been less anticipative role by the local governments, but just like translating what the central governments has been made in terms of housing standard. Or, or, or in, in many cases, the local government is like, trying to bid to get some support from, from the central government. So it, it's, it's interesting that in Jakarta, uh, many local or regional government, they have a representative uh, office. So they, they kind of, uh, is an office where you- Like you lobbying to lobbying, attract yeah. investment. Yeah, 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 this is a pretty so, common- so It's always like, uh, if you uh, see to, uh, or if you position the local uh, leaders, mm -hmm. they just like seeking for some opportunities. Oh, what what are available at the national, and maybe we can right. get that project. How to get that project? That <laughs> like makes sense. Yeah, that yeah. kind of uh, uh, that kind of uh, mindset that is happening mm -hmm. in in many local governments' views. Mm. I wonder. So, like in terms of the project based. Uh, programs that are around housing would you say it's do you think it's fair to say that a lot of those benefit kind of upper middle income or higher income households and in general kind of the lower middle income or the lower income households are usually getting housing just kind of however they can through self-help or informal processes yeah uh First, with this, uh, especially the central government uh, designed projects, mm -hmm. although it can be implemented by the local governments, it's more easier to, to reach the uh, people or residents that has, uh, let's say, uh, formal uh, employment 
for example, if you want to get some and a, some and a bank account, and... Thing, you need bank account, right? Right. Uh, you need a uh, stable works, or you have a clear uh, occupation, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as I told you before the before the uh, our conversation that uh, Indonesia is unique in a way. Uh, we have quite huge or relatively big role in formal sectors, and it's mm -hmm. more difficult to be recognized in the formal system, also in terms of a financing system. Mm -hmm. While the very lower uh, income peoples, uh, it, it's, it's less a uh, structured uh, project that are uh, really designed. Uh, and according to uh, some uh, experts, also from my, my colleagues at the ITB who is doing more focused on housing uh, research, that uh, one of the issue is this project is like fragmented, you're just giving uh, yeah, like even the the bottom up or or the proposal made by certain communities and then uh, sent to the government, local government, and then the government uh, assess. Okay, you can build uh, infrastructure like access road, but it's more like uh, no grand design. It's just like uh the community has to have a need to have a kind of a proposal and there is a kind of annual budget budget that your uh, community leaders can apply for like infrastructure but 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 uh less comprehensive measures on the uh housing and basic facilities uh planning and some say because uh we don't have some kind of a big uh, area projects or or the, the government has doesn't have that kind of a vision how to uh, let's say plan a clear area of houses uh, that that you can more comprehensively plan for the infrastructure and so forth it, it's it's missing in many cities that's that's actually it's really interesting because i i uh in the us i think that we have a similar problem actually where planning has just become this reactive reactive yeah. process right i mean every you know like even in cities where parcels are in theory zoned for multifamily housing there the zoning rules are not clear like what you can build is not clear and every project is you know the developer proposes something and then the city will negotiate with them about what can actually happen depending on what the developer gives so it's funny that that you bring up this uh lack of a grand design i mean even a even a non-grand design, like even just some design would be helpful in terms of like the government saying like, here's what we want to happen more or less. And then like developers and people can build according to these rules. In the US, it's very much like, we're just waiting and then you propose something and then we'll argue about it. And then like maybe at the end, you can build it if you give us some money. Um, <laughs> I Wait, wonder, so- so go ahead. The role of some uh, community leaders or some NGOs can mm -hmm. be helpful in that ways because if you if you rely on the uh, ordinary people to think about proposals, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's that's not really come out of their minds. But if right. in that in in certain areas where NGO uh, has some arms there, they could help the local leaders mm -hmm. to to make an ideas. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and true. It, what other implication is uh, fragmentations? And right. it's interesting because during the 90s, uh, the, the, the urban fragmentation, at least physically, it's because of the patchwork of private uh, projects that are disconnected with each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, through the decentralization, which is now also given to the smallest community, which is village, that can have some authorities and autonomous funding. Mm -hmm. uh, some kind of a infrastructure project can be, in in some cases that I see in, even in in non-urban contexts. Uh, in in non-urban context, the village is big bigger, but if you see some uh, uh, basic infrastructure, it can be disconnected from one village to the, to the other. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So it was not because of the privatization issue, but this uh, micro decentralization issue also creates fragmentation on the ground. Interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting that that happens. I mean, you would expect that more in a federalist kind of country, but in a, in a, in a unitary government, you know, that's in theory, that's supposed to happen less, but I guess it is, it's also not surprising. And extreme and possibly excessive uncoordinated fragmentation is also yeah. a US problem. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, what I, one thing I wanted to ask about in the context of kind of uh, land use regulation in Indonesia is the role of the local kind of what there's like this literature I'm sure you've read about street level bureaucracy and kind of the power of local leaders or local bureaucrats in the implementation of of laws that people might not be aware of. Do you think that kind of the, the local bureaucrats or the local officials have a lot of power in interpreting rules? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a kind of, a, uh, how to call it? Uh, it's like the, the duality or uh, at one point, uh, some literature say that uh, we are have a tradition to to make a lot of regulation and and some say that our uh, house of representative is productive in a way we create a lot of regulations <laughs> uh, the productivity of making laws is quite high but uh, the implementation uh, there are some uh, reliance on certain uh, leaders, for example, or cer certain powers like investors uh, that uh, it's, it's more like co-shaping between the regulation or the plan and, and also the leaders, political leaders and the, the business uh, power. So it, and in, in, in some cases it can be uh, the yeah the justification of the leader's uh, vision and negotiation with the market power and how can be uh, formalized into plan that that's still uh, happening uh, so uh, leadership is quite some research and also I also did some research on this local leadership and because of this inconsistency in the system implementation, uh, the role of local leadership can be important to make sure uh, whether some project or programs are successful or not. So it's there's some contrast situation between one city and others depending on the uh, leadership uh, traditions. I, I, so I have a, a challenging question, maybe. Um, what, what do you think kind of are, this, are the good aspects or the successful aspects of, of planning and land use regulation? And what are the kind of less successful aspects in Indonesia? Because I mean, I, like I wrote that paper where I, I argue that, you know, there's like excessive uh, higher level rules and too many laws. It might seem like a like a place that's going to be very dysfunctional, but then like actually on the ground, it's pretty functional and like people are able to access housing and cities are kind of growing in a more or less, I mean, a, in a way that is relatively well done. I don't know. I mean, I wonder your reaction to that, that perspective and kind of what are the kind of more successful or less successful as of, aspects of urban regulations? Yeah, I think uh, one of the potentially good aspect in the urban planning regulation and when we can try to relate to housing is that the planning regulation, it's kind of a arena where you can contest, where you can uh, also uh, uh, initiate or or where you can also uh, again certain ideas, and and that that's 
that's the the arena is uh, important in some ways. So not just the uh, the output or the plan itself, but uh, during the process, uh, especially since the democracy area and and after the crisis, uh, that uh, socializations or uh, giving information to stakeholders are becoming the norms where at least that, that's the moment you can have uh, some uh, influence although clearly that there is a there are still uh, gaps in terms of power between between stakeholders but at least we have that that arenas that that's uh, that's the, the beginning and uh I don't know what's what are good aspect, but yeah, <laughs> this is a uh, the yeah it, it's it's maybe I don't know I hope I'm not that pessimistic view, but I mean a lot of challenges. Uh, but in the in the last uh, improvement uh, that uh, can be uh, beneficial for future development is. Uh, the aggregator of certain laws. I mean, because in the past we we have we have this uh, trends of uh, fragmenting laws. For example, uh, after the decentralization, there every sector they have their own planning system. So you can imagine if you build your house next to the coastal areas, you have to consider as as well the coastal plan, <laughs> not just the land use plan. If you are closer to the forest area, you have to consider the forest plan. But now with the aggregator plan, at least at the visionary level, the government want to integrate those uh, plans. So make it more uh, simple. Although there is a worry that it's more good elements for the private sector we, we are not yet uh, have a clear implication whether this simplification also will directly benefits the local people and also with the regulation like eminent domain actually the government has the chance to to make a bigger ideas like uh, let's say more comprehensive program where in the past it was very difficult because of this fragmentation of uh, properties. Uh, but with the eminent domain and the government actually have the chance. And, that, and now is the discussion on land banking. Maybe that's also the opportunities uh, after decades of discussion. It, it seems like now put in the, in the policy how we can initiate land banking, but still, what is missing is actually uh, the, the, the the arms to to develop the land because uh, it's still uh, effectively the private sector has the power and how to really link this policy with the development. It's still, uh, I think that's still a long-term issue. The financing has some, uh, th there's some changes because in the past we have some source of public fi financing that are uh, not used. I mean, it's just like put in the bank. But now the government are mm, considering ideas how this uh, money for pensions or some other kind of sources can be activated uh, for uh, the development. But uh, I, I don't know. How, how things work now with regards to this. So that's some optimistic maybe, <laughs> although I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it, it does seem like uh, having a coordination between different plans makes yeah. a lot of sense, uh, right? I wonder what, I mean, so I had a good conversation with a uh, professor in Hong Kong, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Yip, do you know him? 
Mai Ming Yip. Anyways, he studies mostly stuff in Hong Kong, but has also worked in Vietnam for a number of years. And he was saying how in Vietnam, you know, it, it has a ton of rules and laws governing everything. But then it's in fact, like it's almost there's so many rules that at the implementation stage, people have a lot of freedom because you can always find a rule to contradict yeah. another rule. And so because of that, he said, in terms of built environment, you know, there's a lot of freedom to, to for people to build housing and, and shops. There is a proper, there has been a proper in Indonesian society. Uh, the rule is created to be to be break. <laughs> I mean, uh, any any new rules are uh, some people or some parties who think how can we play with the new rules. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what and do you think? Is there a lot of corrupt in terms of like uh, uh, in the production of housing? Do you think there's a lot of corruption? I mean, in terms of like bribing to get a permit or to have your, to be able to build a house, how do you see corruption as a, do you see corruption as a big problem or not so big a problem? Uh, maybe I tend to, has no uh, detailed information whether this is corruption or not, at mm -hmm. least research wise, but at, at the, uh, I did some research on some uh, how uh, new development processes takes place and mm -hmm. what steps what cause info and it seems uh, even or maybe uh, after the decentralization this the cost is uh, higher meaning uh, so many steps are in for or uncertainty there right and and i think in the until the last three years, it's still in Indonesia. It's considered to be a high, highly uh, less certain in terms of permitting systems mm. in the practice. Uh, and with some uh, eminent domain policy and also with some aggregator policy, so some steps are being uh, torn down and right. and, and it's. Some are brought back to the central government to mm -hmm. make it uh, simpler. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, at least uh, some comparative figure, at least that was the figure I think three years ago, it's still quite highly mm -hmm. uh, costly. Yeah. Do you, how did you get your house? You don't have to answer. I'm curious. Yeah, we don't have to include it in the recording. <laughs> yeah, and this is interesting to me as well. I mean, uh, uh, I live in my house. I think it's already almost a decade here, mm -hmm. nine years. And during the period I'm look, I was looking for the houses. I was thinking, but quite idealistic actually. No, I don't want to live in the catchment area. I just finished my research. Uh, about that uh, location and it's uh, there are some issue there <laughs> so i prefer some <laughs> flat areas where right. more more regular uh, uh, urbanized housing setting mm -hmm. bit more in suburbs uh, but what was interesting to me it was difficult to find a regular uh, let's say new housing complex that are fully integrated into the city. I mean, mm -hmm. integrated communities. Right. So if we are reading the literature in the 90s in Indonesia and maybe in some other developing countries, when we talk about gated communities, it's more like a middle and upper income uh, right. house. But uh, I think since my time was looking for houses, even uh, let's say uh, not necessarily middle income. It's it's more uh, uh, sim, uh, uh, smaller smaller uh, lower income mm -hmm. houses, formal mm -hmm. lower income houses. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are gated, and and it's and it's becoming uh, one of the uh, 
sense of prestigious uh, mm. elements of the houses. And is that for safety or just for prestige? And no, we need some research on that, but I think it's combined. Yeah. Uh, because clearly when, when um, between uh, one to other housing complex just next to each other, when it is gated, it, it tends to be higher in uh, values. Right. Uh, okay. and, and, and sense of uh, security, at least psychological, yeah. maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Because in Latin America, a lot of times it's uh, private roads and this sort of thing, but more for security than prestige, I think. I mean, a little bit of both, like you say, perception. So you have a develop, you have a speculative developer built house. Sorry. Sorry. Was your house built by a speculative developer? Uh, actually, uh, even <laughs> interesting. Well, actually, my developer was uh, sent to the court <laughs> at the time oh. <laughs> because of the issue with uh, with some residents. So, I mean, hmm. yeah, they were quite speculator and I was one of the luckiest <laughs> residents. <laughs> So um, yeah, th there is a. I think since the decentralization, it's because of the uh, maybe income gaps are uh, widening. Right. Uh, probably uh, the gene index. Uh, do I need to see the, the real the figures? But that's how it feels. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also, the city is getting crowded, and no no big open space for new project development so what yeah. is happening more like infill development smaller uh, yeah. development where the space are available yeah uh, and more more smaller scale speculators mm -hmm. <laughs> the 90s it's uh, when we talk about speculation it's more like the big developers big companies now even uh, medium developer or small developers they are also engaged in this uh, speculation and maybe in some areas because of these smaller scales uh, that might be open some uh, opportunities for smaller developers to to also uh, have a place in the competition or speculations yeah yeah i mean that's that's one good thing about infill development is that the projects are smaller so you get more more distributed uh, development opportunities among smaller Companies. Yeah, but it's more fragmentation. Yeah. In the past, the fragmentation is between one city with other. I mean, between house one housing estate and other others. It's big one. But now mm. it's between one neighborhood with the other. So right. many projects are just one neighborhood, and they they have the the companies are different with the next one, so they they don't connect with each other. Right, so right. The fragmentation also happening at the micro level, not just at the city or area level. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, this was really good. I appreciate it, Alec. Yeah. And well, uh, I'm happy to. Yeah, we'll 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 be in touch.